knows Mark at some level, um, but I think we all know him in a different way. And I think once you get a chance to read the book, you're going to know him a lot more intimately. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very generous thing he's done by telling his story. So if you'll allow me to talk about my friend for just a moment and brag on him. He's the publisher of the Philadelphia Gay News. He's a gay activist and pioneer. He is born to be an activist. Uh, it's in his blood. He was a young boy who refused to sing Onward Christian Soldiers because it just didn't feel right to him. <laughs> he became a gay raider. He founded and led the gay youth and created the gay youth movement. As an activist, he captured attention and effectuated change through his notorious zaps, which we are very familiar with in this building. <laughs> he disrupted the city council meetings in Philadelphia. He disrupted the Walter Cronkite Live Evening News. He disrupted the Today Show, the Mike Douglas Show, the Tonight Show. <laughs> Have a bill for Mark as he leaves. <laughs> they have an after payment. Yes. He's a political strategist at the local, state, and federal level. He crafts and executes social campaigns, and he helps political leaders succeed if they listen to him and they use him wisely. He's a newsman who is committed to having a talented team of journalists tell stories that are truly meaningful to the community. Because of that, his newspaper business is a success when others are still struggling. He's an advisor to Comcast NBC Universal on LGBT issues as it relates to workforce, governance, procurement, community investment. He's a man who has not forgotten his family and his roots. Having been a child who felt different and who was poor, it should be no surprise to us that he dedicated years of his life to creating a place for low-income LGBT seniors to feel safe, to have a sense of community, to age together while still feeling valued and allowed to be meaningful contributors to the Philadelphia community. He made sure they were honored for all that they've done for us. Mark, to that effect, worked with the city council. He worked with the mayor's office. He worked with a Republican conservative governor. He worked with a conservative state legislature. He worked with HUD. He worked with the vice president's office. And he worked with the president himself. He effectuates change at the local, state, and federal level. Mark is also a husband and has a modern family that's better than anything on television. <laughs> I am truly proud that Mark shares his story in the, and I danced. The book will be a gift for you as you leave. Hopefully Mark will have time to sign a copy for you. His story preserves our history and our journey. It will inspire folks to take action and create the change that Mark has taught us to create. And because Mark is so brave and is so honest in his storytelling, he offers us an invaluable gift by sharing personal relationships and feelings that shaped him, drove him, and supported him as he fought for us. It's almost 42 years to the day that Mark disrupted the Today Show. <laughs> an NBC Universal asset. <laughs> built here in this building. <laughs> so in a sense, we really are celebrating the beginning of the movement to end LGBT invisibility in news reporting and on network television. So we thank you. This is a building where Mark was originally taken out in handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> to read Mark's story about his zap of the Today Show, if you'll be so patient with me. Next up was the Today Show. See, he had a series of zaps, and he was bragging about all of the zaps. 
to, know, to familiarize ourselves with the studio, we took several tours offered by NBC. <laughs> Pages, beware. <laughs> they were quite educational. We gained entrance to 30 Rockefeller Center in the morning hours and just waited in a closet. <laughs> While the news was being read live, I appeared on camera walking across the studio. I believe the director thought this was somehow part of the show. <laughs> the news anchor actually got up out of his chair and, as some people described it, looked like he was trying to climb the walls. <laughs> My first thought was to comfort the guy, but I was there for a reason and had to stay on mission. In mid-sentence, I'm tackled and again wrapped in camera cables, then taken out to the hall with a security guard. As we're walking away, me expecting to head off to jail once again, it was a relief to know that Morty Manford of the New York GAA was ready to bail us all out. Before anything else could happen, a woman yelled at the guard and told him to stop. Barbara Walters, the doyenne of the morning news network crowd, with pen and pad in hand, walked over and asked me why we were protesting the show. My explanation was that it wasn't just the Today Show, but all of network TV that censors us on their news, stereotypes us on their entertainment shows, and keeps us invisible by not having LGBT people on their programs. In the middle of this exchange, a producer came out and told her to get back to the studio since she was about to go on air. She firmly replied that this was a story and she wasn't going back in until she had it. <laughs> Mark, we Me when I came in here today, um, how I felt. Uh, did I feel like an author? And I, I said, I just don't feel like me. Um, Clay, uh, Carol, thank you. And Clay, um, after that introduction, I can now say, um, I read the book. You read the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, well, since you did the story on the Today Show, I'll uh, tell the quick story on the one on the Walter Cronkite zap. Uh, it, 1973, for those of you who don't know, uh, gay community was nowhere in programming. There was only NBC, CBS, ABC, and something called public broadcasting. Uh, that was it. There were no cable stations. There were no internet. Uh, if you wanted to find out something about gay people, you went to the library, if your library carried gay books, and most times they didn't. So therefore, uh, what the world knew about us, they heard from churches, they heard from police, or they heard from the psychiatric uh, community. That was it. We were nowhere. So uh, we decided to change that and make ourselves visible. And we first, of course, were kind enough to call the networks and say, hey, would you meet with us? We're just a bunch of homosexuals. <laughs> Click. Uh, so since they wouldn't meet with us, we did the next thing. We took the meeting to them on their turf where they were. And the way to do that very simply was to go into the studio, wait for the commercial to finish, of course knowing they couldn't cut away with the, if they came back from commercial. And in the case of Walter Cronkite, when he came back from commercial, I stepped between him and the camera, sat on his desk, and held a sign which said, Gays Protest CBS Prejudice. Misspelled. That was spelled <laughs> <not> correctly. <laughs> You've gotten emails from me, I noticed. Uh, uh, that incident was seen by 60 million Americans. It was the first time that an out gay man was on network television. And of course, the next morning he was on every single uh, newspaper's front page. Uh, we then had to go to trial for that case, strangely enough, since I'd broken the FCC Federal Communications Act and was liable for, I believe it was 10 years imprisonment and $10,000 uh, fine. Uh, so my lawyer, Hal Wiener, needed to call the CBS offices the following morning and said, uh, we want to come in and subpoena Walter Cronkite. 
and they laughed and hung up on him. He called back and said, did you know in the state of New York it was legal to Xerox copies of a subpoena and each of those copies are legal? So I'm going in, I'm making 100 copies of the subpoena and if you don't allow me to come in tomorrow at 11 a.m. and speak to Walter Cronkite, I'm giving 50 copies out to Hells Angels, 50 to Gay Actors Alliance members, and I'm offering a $1,000 bounty to the first one to serve Walter Cronkite. <laughs> Needless to say, Hal served Walter Cronkite the following morning. A few weeks later, we were at uh, 100 Center Street for the trial, and the trial was going on, and they literally had to break to bring a projector in in order to show the zap in the courtroom. As we're in the middle of uh, Center Street, I'm talking to my attorney, I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, the man says, you must be Mark Siegel. I looked at him and said, you must be Walter Cronkite. <laughs> Walter asked, why did you do that? And I said, because your news censored and is biased towards gays. He just looked at me and said, that's just not true. And I said, if I can prove it to you, will you change it? And he continued to stare. And I said, last month you did a story about 6,000 women walking up 6th Avenue proclaiming International Women's Day. Did you not? He said, yes, it was a valid news item. I said, you know what, I agree with you. So why didn't you cover uh, that same avenue when 15,000 gay men and lesbians walked up six months ago and proclaimed Gay Pride Day? He stared at me. I said, after my zap of your show, you did a story about New York City refusing to pass a gay rights bill for the third time, didn't you? He said, well, that was news. I said, yes, but why didn't you report to 26 other cities had passed gay rights bills. 